the uh, theme for the uh, afternoon uh, talk is samsara and nirvana. <coughs> it is um, on an uh, airline and coming through those um, magazines which are uh, selling things to the poor board passengers. I think it's called retail therapy. And there were some advertisements for perfume. And one was called opium. And another was called poison. And another was called samsara. And one would thought, why would a perfume company want to use uh, this marketing label? Such things as this, such titles, <coughs> such names which are promoted all over our poor planet. And one has a suspicion that the modus operandi is the name is in a kind of tune of an unpleasant feeling and in this case not feeling very good about oneself poison opium and sour the wheel of suffering so if we buy a bottle of perfume and dab it on ourselves we're going to feel much better now can one imagine any more foolish deceptive <laughs> idea we could spend the whole day sitting in a bath of poison perfume we could wash ourselves in the stuff. We could live in it. But it still won't uh, make us feel better. Let alone a, a few dabs behind the ear and on the wrist. It just reflects the mad marketing culture that we live in. And of course, unbelievable prices for a little bit of smelly water. <laughs> I mean, the human species is bizarre. So all this is samsara. It's kind of a, a wandering around in an ocean of collective madness. And with a lot of deception and delusion. And some of it, of course, quite uh, distasteful. If you look at the advertisements for some of uh, the alcohol, those large, glossy advertisements, and take a look with little care at them. It's not unusual to notice to find in the advertisement where you've got a glass and some ice and a bottle and, and a figure to see, in the advertisement, a face of despair. A face of despair. Take a look sometime. Why have why they drawn that in? Put that in, that block the advertisement in that. And why is it that it's not unusual that in preparing these photographs to advertise the alcohol, Alcoholics are encouraged to be in the advertising agency, to look at the photograph and to say which one makes them feel most thirsty. This is how this neurotic culture works. All oh, this is in Dharma land, this is called Samsara. Life where mind gets um, corrupted and poisoned, we might say. 
and trapped and stuck in a bizarre set of values. So the word samsara, literal meaning of it is a, a wandering on from one thing to another, a kind of perennial, endless pursuit for some kind of dissatisfaction and finding it terribly short-lived and never feeling truly fulfilled, oscillating, going backwards and forwards between uh, pleasure and anguish, pleasure and pain, health and sickness, profit and loss, praise and blame, success and failure and kind of living caught up in that movement, that wandering from backwards and forwards between (coughs) one and the other. And that inner world and the outer world of others that meet it becomes a kind of way of living, a kind of construction of our existence. And that we've invested in that, we've given it a, a, a priority. And because we're so ensnared in that world that we've brought together and made made together, it becomes extremely difficult, extraordinarily difficult for some to actually see outside of it, to see life in a fresh way, in which profit and loss and and success and failure and praise and blame and health and sickness and pursuing and rejecting is not in the way of looking. And so our meditations and our practices and our contemplations <coughs> in a way are a step to have a different sense of life and that different sense of life is what in Dharma language essentially means is pointing to Nirvana pointing to something else and sometimes and this often happens, we've made a kind of gap. And it's not an unusual gap. And the, in the best traditions of the, the Buddhist tradition, the Advaita, non-dual tradition, the Dzogchen tradition, the Zen tradition, Christian mysticism, the Sufi tradition, etc. has said to us and has reminded us what is critical, what is important, is how we see how we see. Meaning that sometimes all that we see is the problems of life. We observe them inwardly, we observe them outwardly. That's all we see. So then there is a wish for something other, something out of this world, something beyond uh, this world. And then we find the duality. We find we make a gap between what this is and perhaps there is the possibility of touching some other dimension outside of <coughs> all of this. And in the best mystical tradition, we are reminded again and again, we don't have to look outside of what is immediate. What we need to do is to look really at what's immediate and see if we can realise it in a completely different way. What have you So how does all of this relate to our practice and our um, um, meditation right here? Some uh, reference has been made, of course, to these uh, jhanas, to these uh, absorptions. And when we're thinking of or reflecting on um, nirvana, which means liberation, great freedom, sometimes in our life, we have a genuine feeling, and that may be moments or a period, of feeling exceptionally and unusually free, in a way that we feel very untroubled. And sometimes that sense and that feeling for us just arises quite spontaneously, or it seems to be the outcome of spiritual practices, or it seems to be located with uh, being in contact with a community of people or in a particular environment, etc. And sometimes, as I say, 
we are touched with life in a certain kind of way which, brief as it might be, there is a sweetness that goes with it and feeling really free, really free. And the inner life is at peace with itself. That inner freedom may reveal and show itself as joy and contentment and uh, happiness and an undemanding way of being. And in such moments for us, it's such that we're not wanting for anything more. We look inside of ourselves and we say to ourselves, do I want anything more? Do I need anything more? And there comes a strong, a firm statement inside of us, no. And even in the most political rhetoric, but even more important in, in spiritual, the sense of freedom, which is nirvana, is a very precious and beautiful sense in life. What often happens for us, though, of course, it feels to be very temporary. We may have some taste at some point, and then it fades, and then it seems like we're back in samsara, back in dealing with the itsy bitsy bits of life, all that's going on inwardly and outwardly. And so it ends up with a kind of feeling, sometimes one's life is having to attend to deal with this and deal with that, and one's dream of one's life feels like nothing else, but life is problem-solving activity until death. I mean, it's one hell of a way to live. And if there's a little interruption of it, one is, feels rather blessed, and then one is back, oh, I've got this list of things to do, all marked out, and if I don't do them, there's going to be a problem. If I don't do them, other people are going to be upset, I'm going to be upset, I'm going to feel a failure, others are going to blame me, I'd better get on with it as quickly as possible, I don't want to wind them up. I've had their email for two years now, I must get round to the client, <laughs> or whatever it might be. And so the view, the relationship of life is samsaric. It's samsaric is that life seems to be a perennial state of things which have to be done to solve problems or to do them so that one doesn't start. And we're living in an environment which views this as the be-all and end-all of existence, the reason for living. It's a certain kind of madness. And then we ask ourselves and we say to each other, but it shouldn't be like this. Something deep down inside, some little voice of intelligence, may not be much left, but just only want a little bit. Which just acknowledges it, it, it didn't even be like this. Why should the relationship to be like to life be one of constant problem solving or doing things to make sure one doesn't start? What has happened to us that we've got so fixed in this kind of mechanistic approach to living? All this is samsara. One thing from one thing to another. Living in a world in which we rather implicitly believe in the kind of ultimate importance of our intention, the ultimate importance of what we do, and the ultimate importance of what the outcome is of what we do. This is Samsara. And that movement from the inner to the outer and the results of all of that would be such that we might ask ourselves, we could ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves, Is anything which has ever happened to me, which is difficult, a fact in
in itself, an absolute fact in itself? Or is it the way I have or I am interpreting a result? Anything that has happened in that world. Oh, the variety of things that go on. I just listed a few opposites. There, success, failure, praise, blame. Good, bad, right, wrong. Uh, all the others, I can't think of them all. Is it the what actually happened? Or is it some kind of relationship we have to what happened? And what if we were to start taking some of the focus off the result and making it extraordinarily significant for us? It's not an easy thing to do because we all start thinking of examples where the result is important. And switch it more to our full relationship to existence. Our full relationship to what arises in us. So that shift may bring about some other fresh awareness that one says to oneself, yes, the results come. Yes, they are arising. Yes, they are arising because in this moment I am looking at existence and I am drawing a conclusion, this is the result. I've got to draw a, a conclusion. And, and if I have a result, I've got to be thinking about the causes for the result. But I've got to pick out something and say this is the result. But the result cannot stand still. No result has the ability to stay a result. This viewing cause and effect, this is the result and the selecting out and calling it a result in which one's, all one's well-being of one's existence begins to hang upon. Is the result out there? Or is it the selection which has taken place and which one is now labelling the result? Where is it? Out there? Or is cause and effect, action and result, a way of interpreting? Is it really out there? Or is it what we have fixated, selected and described and labelled and talked about and bored the minds of the planet about? Because it's a this is the result. Is it the result? Or is it there is no result? There is no such thing as a result. It's a human conspiracy. Life does not stand still. It's only when we fix and we see something as good still called result, and we make that, we in that time, we believe that, and the so-called result is inevitably moved on. Is there a result? Has anybody seen a result? Anybody found a result? Life doesn't stand still. So the fixation, the belief, the uh, identity with cause, effect, a self, a prisoner to result in terms of its well-being, is not really in the nature of things. It's Selection and fixation. 
und ohne Wechsel zentral. It's a strange world. It's the obvious. The so-called self-evident. The conviction that we have. The persuasion of our view, in this case, is all. With a little interest, a little opening out of the consciousness, nothing is quite fixed. And I just went home just now. And I live in one of those little uh, suburban streets, in this case, 57, instantly forgettable little homes. And uh, there was a, a, a funeral, two funeral ca- cars, a little further down the street. And uh, the elderly person living in home passed away, died, passed on, whatever. Mm. Members of the family uh, 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 were there. And when I went across the high street to the banking and some other things there, the uh, funeral service was taking place. And sometimes in the situations uh, like that, you say, oh, life has come, life has gone, uh, etc. The person's life has moved on, and there's the appropriate uh, uh, acknowledgement and appreciation. In fact, while we've been here on retreat, the, uh, the mother of the Queen uh, died uh, a few days ago. There has been the, uh, uh, the funeral today. The, various uh, people paying their uh, 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 last uh, respects and all that goes along with, uh, with all of that. And, and that's a, a time and a moment uh, uh, in the day or in the hour which people's thoughts turn to these, turn to these things and the journey of life coming and going. But I'm sure we can all agree with all of that that nothing stops still. Nature doesn't know uh, a kind of fixation in time, a freezing of the moment. It just keeps unfolding itself, keeps unfolding itself, keeps unfolding itself, <coughs> and doesn't stop anywhere. And when you and I as human beings, we start stopping on something, whatever it, it might be, of course we get increasingly and easily out of touch that the movement and the expression and the unfoldment is still going on. And it's an enormous challenge for us to really be true to life and true to existence and to really move with it. So it's so surprising that the very essence of the Buddha's uh, teaching is genuinely summed up in liberation through non-clinging. That's the essence of the teaching. Nirvana through non-clinging. And that discovery and sense and appreciation and realization is not something out of this world, but it's something where this world is. Jesus said, be ever watchful. The kingdom of God is at hand. The same tremendous statement Nirvana is where samsara is. Not out of it, not separate from it. So we sometimes, through our meditation, through our practices, through spontaneous awarenesses, through a sense of things, we do begin to get some sense of freedom. And it's not like we've transported our consciousness out of this world. Actually, we can sense it immediately. And human beings love, but more than anything, this sense of freedom in the midst of things. I was um, sitting on um, an aeroplane. I was sitting on an aeroplane. And I think I 
mentioned this earlier in the retreat, that three passengers were sitting together, reading biographies. Did I mention this earlier? No. Three passengers sitting, reading biographies. And um, mine was um, about uh, uh, Jesus. And the one who was sitting next to me was reading a biography of the Dalai Lama. Mm-hmm. And the person sitting next to him was reading a biography of Leonard Shackleton, this Antarctic uh, explorer. So I read about the Dalai Lama. And, uh, so I turned to the one at the end and I said, um, This is such an interesting book. And I said, I'd like to swap for a minute or two. And <laughs> <laughs> he looked at mine on Jesus and he thought, <laughs> No. <"Nah." laughs> you know, he probably thought I was born again instead of reborn again. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> so I said, Can I have a look at yours? And uh, I just picked it up and began to read a little bit about uh, uh, Shackleton. This was uh, last summer, coming back from our walk in uh, France. <coughs> and, and it just gripped my attention. I started again uh, reading this. So when I uh, uh, got home, I uh, got another book on Shackleton by the captain of the ship. Shackleton, for those of you who don't know, was in the, um, an explorer in the Antarctica. And in 1917, went on this ship, uh, called the Endurance, if I remember rightly, to Antarctica, and the ship got trapped in the ice. And the 27 men on board had to uh, abandon uh, the ship, and they were sitting on an ice floe. And months and months and months sitting on this ice floe, 1916, 1917, hundreds of miles from anywhere, hoping desperately that somebody would come by and take them off their ice floe. And after months and months they gave up. And uh, Shackleton took seven men with him in a small rowing boat, which the level from the wharf to the top of it, down to the water, was I don't know how many centimetres, 22 inches. In other words, it's less than the height of your bar. And they rode 1,200 kilometres to a whaling station to get help. It's a breathtaking story of endeavour and determination and human courage. And then they couldn't get back to the ice floe where the two other, where the rest of the men were sleeping together under half upturned two other rowing boats waiting and one guy would get up this is the human spirit here one guy would get up every morning on that ice floe and say this is the day the captain Shackleton they'll be back today to collect us get ready men we're off today and he did this every morning to lift the spirit. So some of you wake up in a bad mood in the morning. <laughs> Try and remember. <laughs> and Wesley, in writing about uh, uh, this experience, said, in the midst of all of this, you know, they didn't see a blade of grass for 17 months. One point the ice flow cracked and one of them, in his poor sleeping bag, floated off in the water. You know, it's in the middle of winter. And where he wrote, he thought, my God, it's a grown-up Moses in the mire. <laughs> and they fished him out. And where he wrote, he said, I would rather be living this and be with this because the sense of it is so profound, I'd rather be here than be in, be in London. And, and Shackleton wrote, he said, 
in this, in all this, he said, we have found God through the nature. We have found God through nature. So sometimes it's, as we say, his uh, situation of samsara, never knowing to the moment whether he would survive. And when Shakutan, when they, it took months for Shakutan to get back, they couldn't even get a boat to get, get back to these men on this ice boat. And when they got back, Shakutan was there, and the first thing he was doing was to count up to make sure that every man was still alive. And he was just overjoyed that they all survived while, they, these, while Shakutan and six of them had made this uh, uh, extraordinary rowing journey for 800 miles, 1200 kilometers for, for help. And it's, and it's a situation again where yeah, the, 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 horror and the, the immensity of the plight that they were in was extraordinary and despite all of that kind of samsaric condition as the Buddhists might describe it finding nirvana through it finding an extraordinary sense of freedom and truth and he, he said we, uh, Sakutin said, we only found, we found God because he said, in this, our soul was stripped bare. And we could see. Very beautiful. Dharma teachings uh, acknowledge and pay respect to that, not in so uh, uh, intense a way. And it's not like they became great heroes when they went back because the great war was on. So when they did eventually, after nearly two years of absence, arrive back in Britain, some said, well, they just went off there to flee fighting in the war. Dharma teachings, in a way, in a rather similar way, but less intensely, kind of follow the same path. What I mean by that is that we too are engaged in a process of stripping away a lot of the layers that we wrap ourselves in. The layers of identity, the layers of our roles, the layers of who we think we are, the layers of position and authority and and career and relationships and and the the self in its painful and pleasurable forms, etc., etc. And so in a moment of breath, as Rumi was reminding us uh, uh, yesterday uh, evening, all that we imagine and now think ourselves to be doesn't seem quite so substantial. And then we come back to a very bare, bare existence. A very bare human being. Just as those men did in Antarctica. And perhaps in that bareness of our being, in the bareness of our soul, if you like, in the bareness of it, of it all, perhaps some other, something else can move through us. Something else can... Uh, Show, show itself and so that when we as it were engage in these roles that we have in life and all their function and place and uh, cultural uh, social usefulnesses of, of, of them all the critical thing for liberation is we know that is not who we are we may have all the roles all the functions that uh, go on, and you and I are engaged in some roles here, obviously, etc., etc. But our misplaced way of looking gets us to believe that we are our role. This is samsara. 
And when we know that's not who we are, we've stripped all that bare, we've stepped back from all of that, we've generated another sense and spaciousness uh, there. Without that kind of identity, then there is the possibility simultaneously of knowing who we are in our barest nature and the freedom that it offers and brings us. Therefore, the, the tradition in its great wisdom and in its beautiful insight has uh, reminded us and it tells, tells us it. Nirvana, great liberation of life, is right where samsara is. Nowhere else. Not out of consciousness, not, not somewhere else beyond but somewhere extraordinarily immediately. So sometimes in our meditations, in our quietitude of our, of our being there, it isn't just being quietly, inwardly absorbed. It isn't just feeling moments of contentment and peace and joy, so that precious and perhaps becoming even more rare in our culture. But it's, all, it's also it's a kind of bridge, a kind of stepping stone to a sense of something greater, which is very immediate. A sense of something greater, which is very immediate. And as you heard of the poet uh, yesterday ev- evening, just with our eyes we can be in the evening or in the, in the day and look out at the, the great expanse and see the, the night sky or see the trees and the flowers and the undulating hills uh, rolling before our eyes and all, all of that in a very direct way keeps reminding us of something expensive And that closeness for that, and that love for, for that, and that appreciation, and that gratitude, and all the beautiful things that come from the deep with regard to that, as has been said a few times over the days, it puts all this samsaric world into some minor category. And that therefore the ultimate truth of things is truly immeasurable, truly expensive. There's Ajahn Buddhadasa, my old teacher. When he, uh, when he was 20 years of age, as is customary in Thailand, he took ordination for three months. And at the end of the three months, most young men who take ordination in Thailand will uh, disrobe, have the benefit of um, exposure to their religion, their, of their birth, Buddhism, have the benefit of chanting and taking precepts of not killing and not stealing, and some uh, meditation and some reading of Buddhist texts, uh, etc. And hopefully it does give some support. At the end of the three months with Ajahn Buddhadatta, he decided, and he was engaged at the time, he decided not to disrobe. So his fiance came to attend the disrobing ceremony. I was, when I was a monk, went through the disrobing ceremony. And he said, I'm not disrobing. He said, I've got married. His fiance said, what? He said, I've married the Buddha. <laughs> and he then spent, from the age of 20 till his death at the age of 87, living in the forest. Certainly alone. There used to be tigers there uh, years and years ago in the 30s. And gradually this whole, from just living in the forest, this whole monastery, this whole scene developed around him. 
and he stood there. And the time I first met with him, 1970, and he uh, died um, just over 20 years later. And monks came and stayed, and lay people came, and thousands of coach, and the coach parties would come, and etc. Et he was still there. And all this was going on around, around him. And he said to me one day, he said, two things, there are many, many things, but two things stick in my mind at the moment. He said, we are not destroying this world with ignorance. We're destroying it through being too clever. We've become too clever for our own good. And then he said, the great problem with this world and with people's relationship to it is that we've made the ultimate truth samsara. That's what we've done. We've made the ultimate truth, samsara, wandering on one thing to another, struggling to get things completed, fear of things going wrong, lists of things to do and get them over and done with. He said, we've made that the ultimate truth of life. We put so much into it, that's what we imagine, that's what we think, that's what we believe, and, that's the, and therefore that's the way we live. Instead of seeing it just as a people's agreement. Not a very good one. A very conventional agreement going on with people. And if we see through that, that it's just agreement. It's just talking point. It's just, you do this, I do that, we do this, etc. Going on with all the, the uh, strife and all the stress and all the tension and all the pleasures that go along with it. We just see that that's what human beings are doing and we see through it, then we can see what the ultimate truth really is. And how would we know the ultimate truth? Very, very simple. We feel free. That's how we know. We feel really free. Free from the mess of samsara. So we just go about doing what we do, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, etc., etc., not making much fuss about it. As uh, the, poet, the poet said, um, best, be, the best work done is that one doesn't see much point to it. Just living very freely. Enjoying living freely, being really free, this is uh, uh, Nirvana and the world of forget more change. It's a distraction. It's people's idea of what matters. And then the rook can say, hey, Give us a few reminders of this. It's a great sound. Let's be free to embrace it all. May all beings. Be in touch with Nirvana. May all beings know the ultimate truth of things. May all beings experience happiness as the daily norm. So let's have our quiet little bit.
Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org slash donate.